The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon China Report. We have a really eclectic and exciting show tonight. Uh, yes, I listened uh, very attentively to the Prime Minister's uh, speech. Um, he reaffirmed my confidence in him as a great speaker. Uh, he did not reaffirm my confidence in him as a great statement. Far from it. Uh, I thought that uh, the very nature of his visit to Washington was counterproductive for the issue that he most wants to promote. I think that uh, calling attention to flaws that he sees in the prospective deal is an important thing and that's his responsibility. Doing it in a way that creates a friction between him and President Obama that transforms the whole issue into a partisan story with Republicans on one side and Democrats on the other. And making Israel a partisan issue is a mistake of historical proportions. When you talk about Israeli national security, the national security equation is not just the number of tanks and the quality of soldiers. That's very, very important. That's not all. National security equation includes also other elements. One of the most important elements in Israel, deterrence and security capacity, is our strategic relations with the United States. These relations are not a force of nature. It is something that happened because people made it happen. People can also hurt it. Strategic relations are not permanent. They are transitory. Interests change. Generations change. The political map in the United States is changing. Um, it, given the importance of these relations, to Israeli security, it is incumbent upon us to invest in them, to nourish them, to shield them from unnecessary disagreements. We certainly should avoid steps that undermine the basic foundation of the relations. If Netanyahu is re-elected comes March 17, I believe that there is no way that what just happened over the last few weeks and today will not leave a mark on the relationship between our Prime Minister and the President uh, and on the relations between the two countries. I'll go further and I will say that from several sources I have already heard that some Pentagon officials started to work with Israelis by the book. We are used to intimacy, not by the book relations. I hope this can be contained, but I worry that it may last. It all depends which Israel emerges after the next elections. If it's the same Israel, it will take much longer to fix. If it's another Israel, it can be re rapidly repaired. An erosion of in intimacy an erosion of cooperation, um, an erosion maybe of public support in certain quarters, people who don't appreciate uh, a foreign leader behaving with disrespect to the President of the United States, whether they voted for him or not. Uh, I, I think that on many layers, 
the relations will carry a scar unless we have a completely new policy uh, in the next uh, months. You know, I think that we Israelis should care about how we conduct ourselves. Americans can afford to make mistakes in their relations with Israel. Israelis should not make mistakes in their relations with the United States. Certainly not our Prime Minister. I mean, there was a certain bipartisan support for more sanctions against the position of President Obama. Uh, the, bill, uh, in, to, the, the, the bill that was introduced in order to uh, enact new sanctions, which the President felt would undermine the negotiations and wanted to keep that for later, uh, that bill was uh, introduced by Republicans and Democrats. The Democrats, once this fiasco happened, the Democrats withdrew their support, walked away from that bill, and if you will, undermined what Bibi Netanyahu was out to, to get. So I think, again, on all counts, Netanyahu is right to raise the issue. Netanyahu is wrong to do it in a way that hurts the same issue, the same cause that he came to, to, uh, to promote. We have enjoyed an unprecedented, uh, broad-based American support for Israel. Netanyahu could have spoken to Congress without creating a major crisis be with the White House on the one hand and between Republicans and Democrats on the issue of Israel on the other. N because we cherish American support, we should conduct ourselves in a way that we will not wake up the morning after and say, being the second person in history who spoke for the third time to Congress was also the last time an Israeli prime minister was invited. Because it turned, now, I don't think it's going to be that dramatic. All I'm saying is, it was not worth it. And it was, I don't share the Prime Minister's uh, assessment of the possible deal, okay? I differ with him. But I'll flow, I'll go with him. Based on his assessment on how bad it is, you want to stop it? You don't do it in a way that undercuts your own effort. And that's what he did. It was just not wise. I don't want to say that it was all for domestic politics. I doubt that his campaign strategists did not encourage him. I suspect that they encouraged him to go that way. And I suspect that they are delighted that it happened um, I give the Prime Minister more credit that it was not only campaigning, but also that his sincere concern with the, with, the, with the Iranian nuclear program was the prime motivation. But if you want to stop Iran's nuclear program, make sure that the administration that negotiates with Iran is as intimate and as sensitive to your concerns because you express them in a respectable and professional way. You know, it's interesting, the two leaders, the two com who, are, who compete for prime ministership, uh, Itzhak Buzi Herzog and Benjamin Bibi Netanyahu, are conducting a completely different strategy. Once you know what the strategy, you see how that fits. The strategy of Herzog is aimed at the Likud undecided. He ignores his base. He says, my base has nowhere else to go. They will vote for me anyway. All my effort are on that 20% of a traditional Likudniks who are tired of Netanyahu. And I want to bring them over. So the entire campaign is designed in that direction. I think it's a mistake. I think one has to first energize the base. So every voter comes uh, March 17 
wakes up in the morning and decides to go to vote and not to go to the beach. So I think one has to invest in one's own base while trying to bring more. The Netanyahu campaign is completely different. Ignore the other side, don't bring more voters because we're losing our own. So the effort is to protect the base. Invest in the base, sharpen, because we are bleeding mandates not to Labour or the Zionist camp, but to Benny Bennett on the further right. So you got to compete with Bennett to bring them back home, so you are losing those who are sliding to the other direction. Okay, let's lose them, but net, let's not lose the base. Netanyahu's trauma is he recalls when Likud went down to 12 seats in the Knesset. And what his strategist, what his chief strategist, Arthur Finkelstein, has instilled in his consciousness was the base first, the base second, the base third, the base is everything. So forget about bringing more voters, don't soften your messages, don't change your policy, be the hard line that, that brings the base back home. Standing up to the President of the United States fits perfectly in that strategy. The Zionist camp campaign <clears throat> made two, well, one major error. If you remember, weeks ago, there was a major effort to bring a uh, senior security type. It was either Mofaz or y General Yadlin, one of the two decorated generals, military background, one of them chief of intelligence in the past, and, and, and a, a fighter pilot who attacked the Iraqi, who led the attack on the Iraqi nuclear reactor. The other one, former chief of staff, former defense minister. Why did they do that? When they were doing focus groups on those who are fed up with Netanyahu in the Likud, they found out that when you ask them why uh, you will not vote for Netanyahu, or you might not vote for Netanyahu, they tell you basically, he forgot about us, he doesn't care for people like me, <coughs> he cares for himself. And then you ask them, but will you still vote for him? And they say, maybe. And you ask why? And they say, because he gives me security. The Zionist camp interpreted security as the need for a general. That not what it was. Took them a while to realize that that's not what it was. It was that the leader has to give me security. I have to feel confident in the leader. At that point, and as a matter of fact, if you bring a general, in order for the leader to be stronger, then you are suggesting that the leader is weaker. If he needs Sipi to be prime minister, and he needs Yadlin to give security, then who is he? At that point, they realized that what they have to do is not to accentuate Sipi Livni or Yadlin, but to show the people what are the leadership qualities of Itzhak Herzog. And the whole campaign shifted to say, all right, let me tell you who Itzhak Herzog is. He's a serious guy. He served in a senior position in intelligence. He a uh, businessman lawyer. He three ministerial positions. He knows the government in and out. He was secretary of the cabinet. He seven years served on the security cabinet where decisions are made. This is a guy who is thoughtful, intelligent, reliable, honest. He is the guy you want to pick up the phone when the red phone rings at 2 a.m. in the morning. So it was important to accentuate the candidate for prime minister rather than the team that supports him. Herzog was 13 seats before the merger and he's at 24. Herzog was at 13, 14, 15 percent uh, approval as, as uh, I want him as prime minister. Bibi was 36, 40 
and he was 13, 15. They are now 40, 36, okay? It worked. When I look at the numbers, again, I, I have my doubts about the numbers. Not that the pollsters are not professional, or not that the pollsters are lying, not at all. But I think that the number of undecided is much bigger than those who say that they are undecided. Those who say are 20%. Once they make up their mind, they change the map completely. So we don't know what the numbers are. I think that there is another something like 20% who when the pollster calls, they tell him who they will vote for, but that's a sentiment of the moment with no depth. They might change their mind if something happens like a speech tonight or, some, or something else tomorrow. So I think that the, 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 the share of the undecided in the electorate is huge, unprecedented. It is a result of uh, BB fatigue on the one hand, and they're not excited about bougie, okay? I think that Herzog will be a, an exceptional prime minister, but he's not an exceptional campaigner. And a person who runs for, to, to, to be elected and a person who runs the country are two different skills, talents, personalities. Uh, so there's no excited about him. There's, they are fed up with him. So they are shifting. But if we take the current numbers as our guide, Herzog can form a coalition without uh, Likud. If you take uh, his party, uh, plus merits, plus um, uh, Yesh Atid, uh, plus uh, Kahlon. Uh, you have 12 or 14 Arabs who will not be members of the coalition, but will support it from the outside. You know, there's one mission of a prime minister that most Israeli politicians who did not grow up in politics, Rabin was parachuted from the military, you know, most of them are paratroopers, okay? They come from somewhere else. They don't grow up in the party, 20 years, 30 years experience. First you are in a party, then you are in the Knesset, then you are a deputy minister, then you are a minister, and only then prime minister. Bougie went up through this whole process. What is it that he knows that the others don't? Most prime ministers believe, like Netanyahu too, at least in his first term, most prime ministers believe that once you form the coalition, you have a working machine. You don't. Every morning when you wake up, you have to form a coalition around the issue of the day. You got a horse trade with this party, with that party, with this Knesset member, with this minister, in order to create a coalition that helps you pass one issue through the cabinet, through the um, um, Knesset. And when you finished, you got to make sure that it happens. You know, you know when you're a former chief of staff, you assume that you gave instructions and it's happening. No, that's not the military. It's politics. You keep trading every day. Bougie knows that. And that's why Bougie, in my judgment, will be able to keep a coalition together longer than prime ministers who have a greater majority. Because they didn't understand how much they had to invest. Ehud Barak lost his coalition on the failure to cultivate it on a regular basis, on a daily basis. The assumption that if I say something smart, and if it makes sense, people will follow, that's not bougie. The Leon Sharney Report congratulates the team of BDC, The Price of Peace, and Leon Sharney on the New York Emmy Awards win. The documentary reveals the true story of the negotiations leading up to the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time the Camp David Accords between Israel and Egypt. Watch it on Hulu.com or buy the special feature edition DVD at select stores.
Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the backdoor channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order backdoor channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order backdoor channels. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. What I want is to change uh, things in Israel. Um, I think that uh, the Bibi Netanyahu should go now and uh, we have to have a new prime minister, someone who has more power to change things in Israel. We have uh, problems uh, with education, with economics, and uh, not only the army is the main issue, um, the um, things here politically uh, must be changed from my point of view. Even a small change can uh, move things here in Israel and we want a better life, we want a better life for our kids. We don't want them to leave because many people leave the country because of the situation here, especially economic problems. But. Uh, I'm not sure that it's going to change. People in Israel, they are right. It's a, it's a right-wing people. They, the way to think, the way they see things. They think Netanyahu is much more, much more able to, to lead the country. I prefer Netanyahu. Because I believe him is better to the country. He's much more, much more able to lead the country, much more able to make peace, much more able to, able to, 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 to do whatever I think is good for the country. I think, I think it will be much more strong government being able to lead and make change and make, make the, 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 the mass of the, the situation in this country better for people. It will be much more power strong to, to, how to, to, to lead the country, how to, to make the country work better things. Because he is much more conservative, much more the people originally, historically, the people that came here from 48, they're much more Sfardi, much more, much more, much more right-wing people. And over there, the historic, the, the leftists, they were there. So Mela, over there, much more Hiloni, is much more Dati, and Mela, that's that's why it built the, 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 the social picture of the country. As Mela here is much more Likund, much more over there. The historical, the historical way. I certainly hope there's going to be a change. Uh, I think it's very important for the future of the country that uh, that we get rid of the current government. I don't know who you who you consider the left wing. Uh, I don't think the very left wing has a chance of, of winning, uh, although I think they could be a part of the government. I'm hoping uh, that the Zionist camp will will have the the opportunity to put together a government and to bring in some of the more left wing parties. I think. Tel Aviv has a tendency to lean more towards the left than Jerusalem. I mean, it's part of the demographics of the two cities. In my opinion, it can't be worse than what it is now. And I certainly wouldn't want Lieberman or Bennett uh, to, to be in any position of power or decision making. Um, I think that, uh, that uh, Herzog and Livni can, can have an opportunity to make a difference. I hope so. 
I am going to vote for Bibi Netanyahu. Tel Aviv is left, Jerusalem is uh, is right because uh, in Tel Aviv there is no uh, uh, Katyushot and uh, all these things. Uh, in Tel Aviv uh, there is no many Arabic like Jerusalem. So in Tel Aviv they uh, live in uh, more peace than Jerusalem. So I think in Jerusalem this is the, the terrorist is more than Tel Aviv. I think Bibi is very good for uh, for the Jewish, more everyone. Even if they get more votes, there is still more uh, minutes to the right wing, so probably the next... Um, uh, it's going to be still Bibi, sorry. Yeah. Unfortunately, I mean, I'm, I'm going to vote for Bougie, but it won't help me. The, the majority in Tel Aviv is going to be for uh, Bougie and maybe for uh, Meretz, and in uh, Jerusalem probably most uh, for the Likud and maybe even uh, Shas and the Dvaita UD. It's probably going to be Bibi and... Uh, the, the religious guys and uh, some of the most uh, uh, to the right wings. Um, who do I think is going to win? Well, I hope Bibi. I think he has, you know, <clears throat> the most experience with everything that's been going on the past couple of years. If it's with war, if it's, you know, any confliction that we've been having with other countries, I think he's the most eligible to deal with everything that's going on. I mean, not that anyone in the elections is less worthy, but I just think he could handle it the best and he knows how to deal with it and, you know, how he's handling everything is just the way it should be handled. I don't think anyone else could do the job he's doing. I just think a lot of the promises that are being made, you know, can't be fulfilled just because of the situation the country's in. You know, if it's uh, security-wise or financially, anything of that nature, I just don't think, you know, leaders could promise things to citizens just try and make them vote and then at the end of the day, nothing could be done because we're still needing security. We still need to pay for the army. So either way, taxes are going to be the same. Apartments are going to, you know, still be the same price. So if it's at the end, who could lead the country the best and who has the best, you know, interest for the country? I think it's Bibi Netanyahu. Yes, I'm going to vote. I think, uh, you know, each voice makes a change and makes a difference. You know, do I vote here as well as in the States, and hopefully, uh, you know, who's ever right for the job will win. I think, um, first of all, in the area of Ashdod and, and the South, um, the most are right-wingers, right uh, either right or central. Um, in Tel Aviv, the majority are left-wingers. Hopefully, they can, you know, look past of left and right, because I think, you know, without a radical, I don't think Bibi Netanyahu is radical. I don't think he makes any radical decisions. I think he makes you know, educational decisions and things that can impact the country in a beneficial way. Well, I think, unfortunately, it's going to be uh, even between the left and right wings, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> For me, left means uh, more uh, when we talk about the uh, uh, social program, not the, uh, the foreign, foreign uh, policy. It will, it's going to be very tense because usually the right uh, wing in the, uh, Israel is not that uh, uh, flexible about accepting the left in, the pow in power. Uh, it's, not, it's not the same as we, we on the left. When we, were, we are, I mean, when we are in the opposition, we accept the, the, uh, the fact that the right wing is the majority, but it, I don't think it's the same about the right wing. Yes, I think that they're going to make a, what they call a national unity coalition at the end. <laughs> the Leon Sharney Report congratulates the team of BDC, The Price of Peace, and Leon Sharney on the New York Emmy Awards win. The documentary reveals the true story of the negotiations leading up to the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time, the Camp David Accords between Israel and Egypt. Watch it on Hulu.com or by the Special Feature Edition DVD at select stores. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the Backdoor Channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian Peace Treaty. Become a witness to history and order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order Backdoor Channels.
Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. My name is Sheldon Shorer. I'm an attorney living here in Israel, and uh, one of the things that I also do here is I work for the Democratic Party in the United States, uh, representing the Democratic Party here in the United States and working to advance the interests of the Democratic Party. Uh, I have been past chairman for, on, uh, on occasions. I was once served as the international counsel for the overall umbrella organization known as Democrats Abroad, the DPCA, Democratic Party Committee Abroad of which about 45 countries belong, one of which is uh, the state of Israel. So I served as the international council, now I serve as the local council for Israel. So let's understand that there's, uh, President Obama has, has gotten very bad press uh, here in Israel, and he hasn't been given the, uh, I think, the, uh, the respect that he's, he deserves as being a true friend of Israel. He has been one of the most supportive presidents for the state of Israel, understanding uh, the security needs of the state of Israel and helping Israel in many different ways, much more advanced than uh, even presidents before like uh, Clinton and Bush who were perceived as being pro-Israel and friendly to Israel and understanding of Israel's security needs. President Obama has actually done many things far beyond the others. Uh, his support for, the example, the um, uh, up the Iron Dome project was, was phenomenal. After, after giving support for it, he went to Congress and asked for more money, and we saw how important the Iron Dome project has been in the, in the last uh, conflict with Gaza. Uh, he's agreed to supply F-35s, the most advanced military plane. There has been military cooperation and, and joint maneuvers, which never happened before between Israel and, uh, and America. Uh, the, it is overwhelming support and help and understanding. Uh, there are differences, however, between uh, the Obama administration, which is uh, considered more left, uh, left of center, and the current uh, Israeli administration, which is right of center. But as Obama said, even before he was initially elected in 2008, while he was running, he once said, you don't have to be a Likudnik to love Israel. Let's understand that the, the U.S. Constitution gives the primary responsibility of uh, foreign policy, of determining and shaping and creating foreign policy to the president. The Congress also has a very important role. One of the, pro one of the uh, jobs of the Congress is to support the president's idea by funding uh, uh, different uh, uh, proposals, any ideas that involve foreign policy. Moreover, certain types of decisions uh, the treaties, something that's called a treaty, requires the approval of Congress. Uh, so therefore, there is, there is a joint sharing of power. Now, exactly where the lines occur is very blurred. It's not very clear under the Constitution. So right now, with the Republican Congress, they are trying to assert more of, uh, authority and power. The president is trying to assert his authority and power, and there's a struggle between Congress and the president. Now, in the middle of this struggle, which is both Congress versus the president, 
and Republicans versus Democrat, John Boehner, the Speaker of the House, invited uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu to come address. Prime Minister Netanyahu wanting to advance the interests of the State of Israel and to defend it against the terrible threat of a, an Iranian nuclear weapon was glad to come to Congress to speak to, as he has done twice in the past, to speak to Congress to educate about the needs of, uh, of what the parameters of an, of an agreement should be and also of, of the danger, to alert the world to the danger of this. So his motives were for to defend the State of Israel. However, it also interceded in the middle of this struggle. So where the President, for example, had said in his State of the Union address, I will veto legislation, as that was then pending at the time that this occurred, I will veto legislation that requires sanctions because it'll, it'll impede the, uh, the negotiations. And then here comes Bibi speaking to the Congress. It looks like he is inserting himself into the, uh, into the dispute between Congress and the President. So naturally, uh, the President would not want to support such a, such a thing. So this is a problem. This is a problem, and, it's, and, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a real shame that this problem exists. Because if there's one thing that all parties here agree upon, both Congress, both the President, both Netanyahu and Netanyahu, they all agree that the Iranian uh, weapon, uh, nuclear weapon, is a serious danger and must be stopped. That's the important message. But that message is being drowned out by all the noise that, uh, that attends this, this, this circus of, of should Mr. Tanyo go, and is he interfering in American uh, internal politics, and is he trying to somehow inflict, uh, in, interfere in the local Israeli elections? And all these qu questions is drowning out the principal message. And I think this is a challenge to Mr. Tanyo, that somehow he has to overcome this appearance of interfering, somehow overcome the, the appearance that he is siding with Republicans versus Democrat because we have, um, Israel has strong bipartisan support in the Congress and has to keep that. And there's no reason to get involved and, it, and it's wrong to do to, to anything that appears to, uh, to support one side against the other. But if once he overcomes that, then we can focus on the real questions. The real questions are, how do you stop Iran? And if it's through negotiations, what will be the parameters of such an agreement? How many nuclear uh, centrifuges should, uh, should Iran have? Um, and, and all the questions that, that go around uh, that. So that is what should be focused upon and not this other question of the interference in the elections, which I think was raised mainly by journalists, I'm sorry, I'm pointing the finger, journalists and also by uh, political opponents such as Mr. Herzog who sees this as a political uh, event, whereas uh, I, I really believe in it, Mr. Netanyahu, that it is not done for the purpose of election, it is done for the purpose of defending the State of Israel. All right, I think the, the, the opposition of, uh, of uh, certain Democrats to the speech is the timing and the manner in which it was done. It was done behind the back of the president. It was done uh, as, as an affront. And, and it, it, said it appears to be an affront to the presidency. And this, if, if this was, and if this is true, if Mr. Netanyahu, I would say, if Mr. Netanyahu comes to the Congress in order to support the Congress and saying that under the American Constitution, Congress should have a stronger say in foreign policy, if that is the point of his talk, that's very wrong. If he says, we ally ourselves with the Republicans against the Democrats, that's very wrong. But that's the current perception because of all this noise. And as I say, that is a challenge to Mr. Netanyahu to overcome that. Now, there are strains. And the strains, I think, are artificial, brought about by the chicanery of the Republican Party and, uh, and making this invitation behind the back of the president. And I think that was, uh, that was, that's the, that was the wrong way to go about it. And all of the fallout that's come around it is, is hurting the, the purpose of the speech. And again, the purpose of the speech is something that everybody agrees upon, to stop Iran from having a nuclear weapon. This is very speculative, but I think the answer is that both 
pr uh, President Netanya uh, Obama and the Prime Minister Netanyahu are very professional men, professional politicians, each of whom have their own constituencies. And the United States President takes as his first priority the interests of the United States and the security of the United States, and the Prime Minister uh, uh, Netanyahu takes the interests in the, uh, of, the, of Israel as first and foremost, and the security of Israel first and foremost, and will represent their positions uh, appropriately between each other. I think they're professionals. What personally, what one, whether they feel comfortable enough or if they like each other enough to go out to play golf together or whatever, that's, that's irrelevant. I think they're professionals, and I think they both understand that uh, they represent uh, two, two countries which have strong interests and of affection one for the other and joint mutual purposes, goals, and uh, they will work together. And I, and I expect that this will continue. On the question of whether the United Israel has to obey the United States at every juncture, I don't think anybody would expect that. Israel has its own specific purposes and interests, and the, the United States has its purposes and interests, and sometimes I say they, they, they don't meet eye to eye, and that's perfectly respectable, and, I, and it's appropriate for one side to have a different opinion. So it's perfectly appropriate for, uh, President, uh, for Prime Minister Netanyahu to come in and express his vision. Now, of course, the final decision on the, uh, the negotiations with Iran will be not be made by the Prime Minister of Israel, it will be made by the United States and the other countries involved in the negotiations. But to express ideas about it, this is part of, uh, this is inherent and ingrained in the American system. I think ultimately it's, go it's going to come down to this question. When an Iran came in and, dis and, came and agreed to a freeze and agreed to talks, is this a tactic of Iran or a change of strategy? Is this just, is the old strategy that of developing a bomb and becoming a threat to the world and to the Israel and to the United States, is this old strategy still intact? And all they're doing is changing their tactics. Instead of having a loudmouth Ahmadinejad banging the table, you have a soft-spoken person, Zarif, who, who uh, it sounds nicer, and, but it's just the wolf in sheep's clothing and their, their strategy is the same. Or is this a change of strategy? that the Iran has decided not to become a pariah, but to become a country like all other countries, to have commerce and to continue going, and not, not to uh, be a threat to the, other, to the rest of the world. And, there, and that the nuclear program is simply for developing uh, nuclear uh, reactors and not for developing nuclear weapons. So which Iran are we talking about? The pessimist will, th will look at Iran and say it's a change of tactic only and that Iran is, is a threat. The optimist will say no, Iran is changing. So the agreement, as I see it, would have to be clear as to whether or not Iran is A or B. And I think that uh, President Obama understands this, I'm sure he understands this, and that, he, and that the agreement will reflect this because uh, when it was discussed, should you extend the, uh, the negotiations past March, uh, President Obama said, the Iranian, we're not going to extend it past March. The Iranians simply have to make up their mind. Well, make up their mind about what? Make up their mind as to whether or not they want to join the world of nations and, and be friendly and, and do commerce and, and, go and you know, raise your children and go to sleep, or if they want to become a military power and resurrect uh, the empire of Cyrus the Great. The Leon Sharney Report congratulates the team of BDC, The Price of Peace, and Leon Sharney on the New York Emmy Awards win. The documentary reveals the true story of the negotiations leading up to the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time, the Camp David Accords between Israel and Egypt. Watch it on Hulu.com or buy the special feature edition DVD at select stores. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the Backdoor Channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian Peace Treaty. Become a witness to history and order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order Backdoor Channels.
Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening. A book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. Well, as, as a co-chair of Republicans Abroad Israel, I'm responsible here uh, for uh, organizing uh, American voters uh, who are eligible to vote in the United States and bringing them to the polls, getting them registered, uh, meeting with pre- uh, potential presidential candidates, coming over to Israel as they do uh, to express their views and learn about the situation here in the Middle East, uh, handling media events, uh, radio and television, internet, uh, mainstream media and so on uh, here in Israel and abroad, uh, and um, holding public events uh, for visiting uh, uh, politicians from the United States, principally town meetings with our uh, American voters here in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, around the country. The stakes are too serious. Uh, The Prime Minister is there not to, to put on a show, but to convey a message that Perhaps he and only he can do effectively, and that is the threat that the Iranian uh, weaponization uh, program poses certainly to us here in Israel, where it's an existential threat, uh, but also to the United States and to the Western world as a whole. Uh, And it's not just the nuclear weapons that that Iran is uh, uh, threatening. It's also, of course, the number one sponsor of, uh, state sponsor of terrorism in the world. And uh, it is making a play to be the principal power, the hegemon, in the Middle East. They're surrounding Israel, really on all sides, between the Hamas, Hezbollah, Syria, the terrorists in the Sinai, uh, and uh, now into our south in Yemen, uh, throughout the Persian Gulf. The Iranians are very skillfully maneuvering themselves really at the expense of more, perhaps more moderate uh, Arab powers like uh, Egypt and a non-Arab state like Turkey. But the Iranians are making their, their influence very much felt, and if they were, God forbid, to obtain a nuclear weapon cap- capability, uh, I shudder to think uh, what the Middle East would be like. I don't think, you know, they don't, the Obama administration knows the facts very well, but they have a different set of priorities and ideologies. I believe strongly that the President of the United States really does not, is not concerned about the Iranian nuclear threat. Uh, and he's not concerned primarily about the Middle East. He is concerned about reaching out to Muslim powers uh, like Iran and the Muslim Brotherhood in various countries. As he's invited them to the White House recently, to my amazement. Uh, Israel doesn't seem to figure very heavily in his calculations. And uh, I think it's more important to him to reach a deal with the Iranians than to worry about Israel's security concerns. And that's, of course, one of the reasons why Prime Minister Netanyahu was invited by the Republican leadership uh, to speak before the joint session of Congress uh, tomorrow in order to make that point clear Again, it's not just about Israel. It's about the world as we know it. And the United States under this president has made a, a decision, a very calculated decision, to reduce its, imp- its footprint around the world. And that's created political vacuums in the Middle East, in the Ukraine, in the Far East, in Latin America, uh, uh, which are being filled by powers that are really inimical to the United States and the Western world. This is a great tragedy and one that we as Republicans want to see uh, rectified 
in 2016. Because the speech, for reasons that have nothing to do with the Israeli elections, but are coming, is coming before the Israeli elections, and the Israeli elections are all about whether Netanyahu will continue in office or not, those people here in Israel that want to see him out of office, and that includes not only his political opposition, but the, but the media and the uh, academic elite, uh, they have made this into a huge story, a lot of noise, which we're here mostly, hearing mostly here in Israel. In the United States, except for this week, it's been really a non-story. Uh, Mr. Netanyahu has, long before he became prime minister, championed the issue of the Iranian threat around the world. And it was basically his doing, his doing alone that brought the international community, including belatedly uh, the United States under Obama, into a, uh, a, a situation where they recognized the importance of imposing sanctions, economic sanctions against Iran. Unfortunately, uh, that whole sanction regime has been very short-lived. And I think uh, if this president has anything to do about it, he's already told us pretty much what he plans to do, he'll, he'll relax or even abolish that regime if he can. As the only Jewish state in the world, it is only Israel that really is in a position to speak for the Jewish people as a whole, with all due regard to Dianne Feinstein from California. I mean, she, she is a, a very accomplished politician who's been elected by the good people of California as their senator in Washington. But she doesn't represent just Jews. She represents Latinos and Afro-Americans and Asian Americans and white Americans of all, of all, of all colors and, and ideas in California. She is not a, a speaker for the Jewish people. Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, is. Now, you don't have to agree as a Jew with everything that he says, but he is the one that really has the most legitimacy to raise Jewish concerns and, uh, to the world and in today's world, where not only Israel but the Jewish people is threatened both spiritually and physically, as we've seen in Europe recently and other places. I mean, the Prime Minister of Israel, the leader of the only Jewish state in the world, must stand up and say something about this. You know, 70 years ago, before the Holocaust, we didn't have anybody who did that. Nobody listened. Nobody cared. Today we have a Jewish state, and thank God we have a Jewish leader of the Jewish state who can make these and press the case for the Jewish people around the globe. There's large, long-standing precedent for foreign leaders from all over the world to come to the United States which until the Obama administration really was the leader of the free world, um, to press their case on issues that are of vital importance to them. But here Israel is coming not only to press its case uh, on an issue that affects Israel, you know, the life and death of the Jewish state, but also uh, has direct implications for the security of the American people, and not just the American people, the Europeans and all other freedom-loving people around the world. And something's going on in the Middle East which is really very frightening. The spread of Islamic fanaticism, jihadism, and the spread of the Iranian hegemony over the Middle East and its nuclearization is troubling, by the way, not just Israel and not the West, but also many of the, the large stable Arab regimes uh, in, our, in our area. I'm talking about Egypt, I'm talking about Saudi Arabia, the, the Emirates in the Gulf, Oman, Bahrain, Kuwait, and Iraq, which is more or less under uh, Iranian occupation at the moment. Even though the White House may not have a, a, a particular love for Israel or its, its security interests, the military and, and intelligence establishment, both in the Department of Defense and the various ar armed forces, and in the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, and so on in the United States, have a close and, and, and very deep, uh, intimate working relationship with their counterparts in Israel, both in the Israel Defense Forces and in our uh, intelligence uh, organizations here. And that cooperation continues to go on 
notwithstanding the squabbles that are happening at the highest political levels. And the reason for that is because the interests, the strategic interests of Israel and the United States remain closely tied to one another. And that's, so it's not just that the American people, which has a strong emotional attachment to Israel and historical tie to Israel, but, but also the establishment, the military and intelligence establishments understand that we, Israel and the United States, share common uh, strategic goals and common values and, uh, and concerns that will re require their close cooperation. The President of the United States, he, w he doesn't want to see Netanyahu reelected. I mean, everybody knows that. And he is not, no, he's not coming and called for that directly, but he sent a Secretary of State to meet with the opposition candidates and, and to bolster them and to say certain things and to constantly undermine Pre uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu as speaking now as, as an Israeli rather than as an American, I think people here resent that kind of interference and they, they you know, they, we have our own issues, you know, here, that we're going, we, which we will decide. And we don't need help from anybody else, including President Barack Hussein Obama, to help us make that decision.